I don't know where to start. I want to bring some, tie some things together, and I got a lot of them up on the board, and I don't know where to, to walk into it, but um, I guess I'll start over here. I'm trying to bring some thoughts to a conclusion from my presentation and from the other presentations. Um, over here, I guess. No, where was it? It's over here. Start here. Where, where I started on the first presentation is an argument that because Millerite history is repeated to the very letter and that you can portray their history as an increase of knowledge that progresses until the door closes on October 22, 1844, and because we understand that the line of the tribe of Judah in Revelation is the one that is unsealing the book of Daniel, in Revelation, he's portrayed as producing this increase of knowledge by removing seven seals. And based upon one of the primary characteristics of the line of the tribe of Judah, uh, he illustrates the end from the beginning. The first seal that was opened for the Millerites was the Judgment Hour message given to William Miller. And the seventh seal was the perfection of that message that was brought to that history by Samuel Snow. And so up here, one of the arguments that's, that's going on in this uh, counterfeit movement time period is that it's after midnight that there's a prediction given. But when we go into Millerite history, we find that on May 2nd of 1844, before the Boston Midnight Meetings, that Samuel Snow gives his prediction in advance of midnight, um, therefore typifying that before midnight in our history, the message that is typified by the midnight cry in the Millerite history would be put in the public arena in advance of midnight, not after midnight. But the first reference to the midnight cry is found in Exodus 11. And before the angel passed over at midnight in Exodus, Moses had went in before Pharaoh and given a prediction that this was about to take place. Uh, the first reference, of course, in the scriptures is is the most important. So when we're considering does the prediction come before midnight or after midnight, the rule of first mention tells us that based upon Moses standing before Pharaoh, there must be a prediction given before midnight. And based upon the beginning and the ending, in the beginning of Advent history, the prediction was given before midnight. And the prediction that's given is what brings to perfection the original message, and our original message is Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Therefore, we need to have a prediction that is derived from or brings to perfection Daniel 11, 40 to 45 before midnight. We are saying that that prediction is the light that comes out of Daniel 11, 1 through 39, identifying that there is to be a surprise attack um, against the United States by Russia, which Russia will prevail, um, and this will mark midnight. Um, in, in conjunction with this, it has been demonstrated publicly um, that the last general conference session that Sister White ever went to was the 1909 general conference session. She was 81 years old, and when you go through how many sermons she gave at that general conference meeting, what the topics of those sermons were, the, the controversy that preceded the opening of the general conference, uh, all the circumstances there, you can see that that general conference session was marking midnight. So she comes to that general conference session at, eight, at the age of 81. Samuel Snow's prediction on May 2nd of 1844 was 81 days before January 21st at midnight, July. July yeah, thank you, July 21st. And in Second Chronicles 26, 16 through 21, we have an illustration of a king of the south, the king of Judah, lifting up his heart against the Lord, which is just what the king of the south does in verse 12 of Daniel 11 after the surprise attack. Uh, that defeats the United States. Russia is portrayed in verse 12 from the history of Ptolemy, 
bringing about a persecution in Egypt against the Sabbath keepers. He is a king of the south that is lifting up his heart against the Lord. This is marked as midnight. As a witness to this, you go to the story of Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 11, which is the king of Judah, therefore a king of the south that lifts up his heart and he wants to go into the temple and desecrate the temple, but 81 priests oppose him from making that action. So we've, we've put in place an argument that there has to be a prediction that it is the midnight cry message for our history that precedes the closed door at midnight. Okay, that's the, the seriousness of what this material is showing us. We have, not, we have nowhere come close to taking the characteristics of the French Revolution or the light about the presidents of the United States and, and dredge the whole vein of gold that is in both those stories. But over here, I want to remind us that when it comes to the French Revolution, that 1793 is a waymark most definitely pointed out in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, many things happened in 1793. Feudalism is brought to a conclusion. The king of France loses his head. Uh, there's a new um, dragon power that's introduced. This is the arrival of the spiritual king of the south. I'm often saying when I'm presenting this, this is the beginning of the king of the south. It really isn't the beginning of the king of the south because the Ptolemies have been the king of the south throughout history. What I mean by that is this king of the south is the king of the south that is represented by the political um, theory of communism in history, in the French Revolution, and that when you understand the difference between the French Revolution and the American Revolution, they are so closely related, absolutely, it's a prophetic connection. France typifies the United States. France is a two-horned power typifying the two-horned power of the United States. But what is sometimes missed is that the French Revolution is an illustration of a revolution that takes place at the end of the probationary time of the glorious land. Because France was designed to be the glorious land of Europe. The Protestant Reformation was supposed to be established in France but it was resisted and rejected exactly 258 years to the very day before King Louis XVI lost his head. The first Protestant Reformation martyr dies on the very same spot that King Louis XVI is going to die. And from this point on, 1793, you have the reign of terror and you have the anarchy of the French Revolution. And what this is illustrating is that 258 years previous to that, the Lord attempted to put the Protestant Reformation in a premier position in Europe and the two-horned power of France was supposed to be the champion for Protestantism, but it rejected that opportunity and it, when it came to the end of its time period as a prophetic player, it is illustrating the cup being filled in the glorious land. Um, even though the constitution that was introduced in 1789 in France is very close to the constitution that was introduced in the United States in 1789, it didn't matter because France is illustrating the glorious land when the cup of probationary time is full, whereas the American Revolution is be the beginning of the glorious land where they still had opportunity to fulfill their high calling, which of course they did not do. And we're now getting ready to repeat the history of the French Revolution because they typifying us were also typifying us, the United States, when it fills up its cup of iniquity. So this history here, very significant, but because 1793, among other things, is the beginning of the King of the South that we deal with in Daniel 11, um, 40 to 45, we know that Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. So when we find that at the midnight cry way mark, the King of the South comes to his conclusion in verses 15 and 16 of Daniel 11, then you have the end of this king of the south, and therefore the attributes that are prophetically marked at the beginning will be repeated here at the end. Okay, so here you're, you should expect to see a kingdom 
overthrown, which at, at minimum you can see Russia being overthrown at this point in time. You would expect to see a new dragon power, which you do. This is the beginning of the seventh kingdom. It's the beginning of its rise to power right here at this spot, the seventh kingdom being the United Nations, which is a dragon power. Uh, you should expect to see here feudalism returned because in 1793 feudalism was overturned and the feudalism is referencing the civil war and slavery that Sister White says will come back into this country and the obvious place where it comes in is in this crisis time between the midnight cry and the Sunday law, a progressive escalation of, of chaos. Um, and of course, if we, if we would have time to look into the, the, the light that comes from Pan, you'll realize that right here at the midnight cry, this is where William Miller's casket is fully restored at the end of the world. Uh, all the gifts are returned to the church triumphant because this is the church triumphant. And when William Miller's casket is fully restored here, it shines ten times brighter uh, than the sun. But this is a time period of a counterfeit and the counterfeit that takes place here, uh, both in the world and in the church, is this is where Pandora's box is opened. And T Pandora's box in Greek mythology, if you look closely, it's a casket. And William Miller's was a casket. So you have Miller's casket being opened here while the church triumphant is shining ten times brighter um, than before, and at the same time, Pandora's box is being opened uh, for those that are on the wrong side of the issue. There's much more to say about, about that, but um, right here, reign of terror is going to begin, uh, to be, it will be repeated, uh, and therefore, the, the light that's coming from the Battle of Paneum and the Battle of Raphia in Daniel 11, verses 10 through 16. Uh, there, there's never been such, I don't know, I can't say there's never been, but from my personal experience, there's never been verses that have produced this many uh, manifestations of lines of truth. It's just, there's so many uh, wheels within wheels here that uh, it's like Ezekiel looking at it for the first time and he's just overwhelmed with, it seems confusing at first sight, Sister White says, but it, it can be brought into perfection through the diligent efforts of the students of prophecy and the presence of the Holy Spirit if they will take up that task. In, we also have a line here about the presidents. I'm sure you, you already noticed that in this particular line, seven presidents that lead to the first speaking of the United States, which is the Articles of Confederation. Ten presidents that follow, that lead to George Washington. So this way mark here, first president of the United States, clearly typifying the last president of the United States, Trump. So I'm sure you've recognized that in the presidency you have illustrated Daniel 11, verses 1 through 45. Okay, and then it transcends into the 10th kingdom, and when the threefold union is placed, uh, you can see the three taken away from the ten produces seven, but in reality, the, 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 the primary application of this seven here isn't those seven kingdoms. I've, I've been saying it this week because I, it just slipped my mind. But right here at the Sunday Law, this is where the, the formula, if this is the right way to express it, of Revelation 17, 10 through 12 are. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, one is yet to come, and the eighth is of the seven. Okay, so we can see this formula back here. This seventh president of the United States is also the first of the ten presidents. Therefore, at one level, he is the eighth. He is of the seven because he was one of the seven presidents that were in, that were doing their job when there was no constitution. So you see this, this uh, formula that the eighth is of the seven and this being a chiastic structure when you get from the first president to the 45th president, this should play out this way, and it does. Because at the Sunday Law, you have the threefold union. So you have the number 10, when the 10 kings come together with the president of the United States became, becoming the premier king. 
you have the threefold union. But this, even though I have it, a period of time expressed here, this period of time is so short. In, in Revelation 17, 17, it says these ten, ten kings agree to give their kingdom unto the beast. And it says twice of them that they're going to rule for a short space or for one hour. But the one hour they rule with is the hour that they rule with the papacy. So the coming together of the threefold union is at the Sunday law, essentially, even though there's a transition from the sixth to the seventh and to the final threefold kingdom, it's pretty much right here. And the seven here is representing the Sunday law crisis. Okay, the one hour of persecution from the Sunday law in the United States till the universal Sunday law, it's about Sabbath and Sunday, and the symbol of that is the number seven, the Sabbath. So that, this here, is more accurately um, portraying the Sunday law crisis that goes to the close of probation here. The church triumphant. Um, we know the church triumphant, the, the first consideration of the church triumphant, I don't know, consideration. The church triumphant is put in place at the Sunday law, okay? Uh, at the very general level, but we know that it's actually going to be the priest and the Levites are going to be purified or separated from the, the church militant at the midnight cry, but we also know that the first fruit of the first fruits, because the priest and the Levites together go to make up the first fruit offering, but as that first fruit offering is made up, the priests are made up first, so they are the first fruit of the first fruits, and this is consistent with the first fruits in the spring feast. This is the autumn feast that we're dealing with at the end of the world. And in the spring feast, Christ was the first fruit of those that died, but he brought with them those that had died with him to heaven. So there was a two-part first fruit offering in the spring feast, typifying a two-part first fruit offering at the end of the world. And the first part of the first fruit offering in the spring feast was was. Christ, who is the high priest. So the priest is the first step in the first fruit offering, and then there is the multitude that comes after, which we're identifying in our history as the Levites, but in the spring feast it was those that were resurrected at his resurrection that went to heaven with him as trophies, as a first fruit offering. So we're, we're seeing that at one level the church triumphant begins here at midnight. This is the end of the church militant, and it's the beginning of the church triumphant, but this is more perfectly illustrated at the midnight cry. And the reason that I have the first day of the first month, first day of the fifth month, is Ezra 7-9. Ezra's coming out of Babylon on the first day of the first month. He gets to Jerusalem, first day of the fifth month. This is marking Jerusalem at the midnight cry. Jerusalem is typifying the church triumphant, among other things, uh, even though we've already ex identified the caveat here back here at midnight. Um, this, is, this is many things. One thing that wasn't said that I don't know that I'm, I'm sure all of us understand this, but I meant to say it during my presentations, is that when, when, these, when the other side of the issue is saying that the foundation is laid in here in the midnight to midnight cry time period. Uh, we gave them a little leeway when they, before they actually got clear about what they, what they meant. That, okay, maybe they're saying that because this is, they're looking at Levite history, therefore there'd be a foundation laid here. Uh, but once, once they say the judgment of the living begins at midnight, then all their foolish teachings come into clarity. Okay, so... The, uh, another argument that needs to be considered here is that not only can you not move the way marks or tamper with the foundation, there are some lines of prophecy that when they're plugged in here, you, you can't just repeat them at each fractal level. Okay, what I mean by that is there is a, there's, a couple, there's some stories that are going on here there, that are linear, if that's the right way to say it. Okay. There is a story going on in these reform lines about the building up of Jerusalem, and it's a very specific story. First, the foundations laid during the time of the first decree. Then, 
Jerusalem is finished before the second decree. It's before the Sunday law that, the, that Jerusalem's built. And then thereafter, in this history, the streets and walls are built in troublous times through the work of Nehemiah and others. So the point is, is this is a linear truth, and it's, a, and it's an important truth. It's about the restoration of Jerusalem, the church triumphant at the end of the world. And it has stepping stones that go in a specific order. And the f- understanding fractals does not allow us to, to destroy that story. Okay? There's other stories in here. There's the transition from, from the covenant people that are being passed by and the covenant people that are being restored. Okay? So in, this, in the story of how the covenant people that are being passed by are being passed by, You've got steps way back here, all the way into the generations, but at, at minimum 1957, 1989, to where you're seeing, when you get to 9-11, you're seeing the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church coming to its conclusion. You can show in, 1980, in 1989, Sister White says, at the birth of Christ, the Jewish nation was being passed by. So even at the time of the end, the, this, this separation between the old covenant people and the entering into covenant with the new covenant people. The separation from the church militant and the transition into the church triumphant is a linear teaching, okay? It's linear. You got, it's here you're having the horn of David butt out because this is going to be the reestablishment over here of the Davidic kingdom, okay? But you, you following me? You can't, you can't just randomly take the the budding out of the Horn of David, and put it at each of these way marks and not destroy that linear linear story. It has to be preserved. There are some way marks that possess the same characteristics or similar characteristics of of other way marks, and with those, okay, you've got some wiggle room. But the wiggle room does not allow you... One saying of the Savior is not to be used to destroy another. And that's, that's part of what's going on here in this counterfeit movement. Now, um, over here, we didn't spend a lot of time on this either, but um, go to Deuteronomy 4, verse 48. <clears throat> Verse 48 of Deuteronomy 4 says, From Aror, which is by the bank of the river Arnon, even unto Mount Sion, with an S, which is in Hermon. Okay, the Hermon Mountains are north of Jerusalem, far north of Jerusalem, and that's Mount Sion with an S. Okay, Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem, is with a Z. But typically... When we read Sion and Zion, we're thinking it's just some kind of translation anomaly and that they're the, they're the same place, but they're not, okay? And it, <clears throat> that, that contributes to what I want to say about Sion in, the Mount, in Mount Hermon. The Mount Hermon, if you, if you could look straight north of Jerusalem, <clears throat> you see the two peaks of Mount Hermon, the snow-covered peaks. That snow goes down into the rocks, and that melted snow comes bubbling up out of a fountain, of, it's called, that's in a cave. And that's called the Fountain of Pan. And it, they, they call it a bottomless pit, this fountain, because I guess it was 800 foot deep, all right, which is a deep spring. And when they'd cast a rope down in it, just, they never got to the end. So this pit where this water comes out of at one level, metaphorically, is the bottomless pit, all right? And this is the headwaters of the Jordan River. And the Jordan River, the Jordan means descender. At one level, the Jordan River is Christ, who left the peaks of Hermon, Mount Sion, because there's a deliverer that's going to come out of Sion, okay? And he came down and he descended and the Jordan River goes all the way to the Dead Sea. He descended so far that he died for you and I at the Dead Sea. That's in there too. 
But it, what is also in there is the baptism that's represented in the Jordan, which you and I have to be baptism, baptized into his death because this river is going to the Dead Sea. So there's all kinds of important truths just associated with the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, but you can't, now that we know it, you can't separate that the headwaters of the Jordan River come from the Fountain of Pan in the Mount Hermon area of Sion, okay? And this pit where the uh, earthquake came, an uh, earthquake in history came, and the water does no, no longer comes out of this fountain, but it did in past history, okay? So I'm acknowledging that it no longer comes out, but still this very same spring still makes its way out of the mountain. That is the headwaters of the Jordan. But in the time preceding Christ, Caesar gives this area to Philip the Tetrarch to manage. So Philip, in order to praise Caesar for the political trade-off, he builds Caesar a temple. So in this area where you find the Temple of Pan, because in front of this cave where the pit is that these waters come up that feed the Jordan River, they built a temple, and it's the Temple of Pan. But when Philip gets to be tetrarch over this area, he builds a temple to praise Caesar, and it's the Temple of Caesar. Okay, So when Jesus is here on earth, Paneum is no longer called Paneum. It's called Caesarea Philippi. Um, maybe I don't have it up here. There's Philippi. Okay, all right. So anyway, that, there's, there's, there's double nature in Paneum now. Caesar being state, Pan being the false religion, church, okay? And it just, it, it, there's no way it's just a nice accident that when you're in Matthew 16, verse 18, which is the formula that's associated with phi, which is the root word for Philippi. There's no, there's no accident that it's in Matthew 16, verse 18, where Jesus is saying to Peter, upon this rock will I build my church. And the building of his church is always pointing to the end of the world, and the establishment of his church at the end of the world is the raising up of the church triumphant at the midnight cry. Because this is where Jerusalem is chosen again for the final time, right there at the midnight cry. And here, Paneum, this battle, is the waymark of the midnight cry. And when Jesus is in Paneum, which was then called Caesarea Philippi, he's talking to Peter and says, Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's no way that that's an accident. So what I'm saying is, if you can follow it, I'm not saying so much about this right now, is that in these 39 verses in Daniel 11, you have a typified history that was already put in place and acknowledged by the pioneers of Adventism that we have now recognized provides two more waymarks in the history of Daniel 11, verse 40. What we could see in verse 40 before this was opened up is that the Soviet Union was swept away in 1989, and the next thing to happen in Daniel 11 was verse 41, the Sunday Law. But Daniel 11, 1 through 39 is still Daniel 11. So once that's been opened up, now we have two more waymarks in the history of verse 40. We have midnight and the midnight cry, and that is profound enough to qualify as the midnight cry message, but it isn't left off there. When we get to the midnight cry in this history, when we get to Paneum, we also see this information coming that, that is, takes you back into the history of Paneum, Caesarea Philippi. Paneum, in terms of the 12 tribes of Israel, it's in the, the area that was called Dan, which means judgment, judge. Okay, so this is all, all in... 
in the context of the judgment, okay? And it, what they did in those mountains in Dan is one of the primary uh, employments is that's where they quarried stones out of the mountain, okay? And the quarrying of stones for the temple is a subject that is part of these reform lines. The stones get cut out in advance of 9-11 so that when the foundation is laid after 9-11, the stones have already been prepared to be put in place. So there's, there's so much prophetic relevance to this information that it's, it's just, it's way beyond the light that was brought about by Samuel Snow in the Midnight Cry. That's a pretty profound thing to say, right? I mean, I'm pretty, not profound, but pretty, I'm opening myself up to some criticism, but I'm prepared to defend it. Okay, now, in, in Matthew 16 and chapter 17, we haven't got time to walk through it, but here's what I want you to see. When you read chapter 16, you check this out and see if it's not so, okay? This is a breakdown of, of chapter 16 and chapter 17 over here. Matthew, what did I say? I don't know. Yeah, okay, Matthew, yes, yes. Okay, the, the, first, the, the first chapter 16 of Matthew, it opens up with the Pharisees asking Christ about a sign. Now, brothers and sisters, you, you, if you're not familiar with this counterfeit teaching, one of the, the misdirections that's being employed is there's a definition being placed upon the signs that is incorrect. Okay? And from these incorrect definitions of the signs, some of these false premises are held up. Okay? So right there in the beginning, the, the, the sign, the three signs at least that we're dealing with now is the, the sign of the abomination of desolation, okay? which the Sunday law, time to flee. That's one sign. Another sign we're dealing with is the sign of Jonah, because the people were asking Christ on a regular basis, give us a sign, and he would say, there's no sign given to this wicked and adulterous generation but the sign of Jonah. Okay, so that's another sign that is a prophetic issue that's being misrepresented in this history. And then you have the sign of Cyrus, okay, um, that's also being misapplied. In, in this time period. So what I'm saying is that Matthew 16 has an absolute direct present truth application to the here and now. So when you start into Matthew 16, you're going to see that the first verses are dealing with this very issue about the Pharisees and Sadducees asking Jesus for a sign. And he says, there's no sign going to be given to this adulterous and wicked generation, but the sign of Jonah. And there are several little arguments that are going on about this. One of them being is that 9-11, is there a distinction between, no, is that the way to say it? That generation, in Luke 21, we established a long time ago that in Luke 21, after in verse 6 and 7, the disciples asked Jesus for the sign of the end of the world and to explain the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus begins walking down a a historical sequence leading the, the, the readers of Luke 21 down to the end of the world. Once he gives them that historical narrative, then he speaks unto them a parable. He says, behold the trees, all the, the fig trees and all the trees. And Sister White, when she's commenting on this portion of Luke 21 in Great Controversy, she says, Christ pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring. Okay, when we came to 9-11... We began to understand that Islam's restrained. We have to go back to the old past. That information comes together. We, find, we, we get to the point to where we recognize that you can take the, the structure of Luke 21 and you can show it played out in Millerite history and then you can place it on a line of our history and you can see point by point that the Millerites are governed by the prophetic structure of Luke 21 and in so they are typifying our structure. Okay? And in Luke 21, the point I'm getting to, there reaches a point where Jesus says, this generation shall not pass. So Luke 21 taught us that we had to see 9-11 because this is where the trees began to bud out because what causes the trees to bud out is the latter rain. 
You had to see the latter rain begins to fall at 9-11. But disregarding that truth, the statement is, this generation shall not pass. So there is a, a pointing to a generation at 9-11. Okay? Now you have to determine what that generation is, and we determine that this is the generation of 1 Peter 2 the chosen generation, the holy priesthood that should show forth the praises of him that called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, so from that point on, we understood that those that recognize 9-11, because Jesus pointed us to the budding trees of spring, and Sister White repeatedly says, if you cannot recognize the latter rain, you cannot receive it. She repeatedly says that. So those that recognize the latter rain begin to sprinkle at 9-11, are this generation that shall not pass. So now you have the question, are they the chosen generation of holy priesthood, or because of the definition that's being placed upon the sign of Jonah, are they a wicked and adulterous generation? And they're being taught that there are, we're being taught from this other side that it's a wicked and adulterous generation because you cannot see a distinction in either party until you get to midnight. Therefore, Everyone from 9-11 to midnight is the wicked and adulterous generation. Okay, so, so I'm, just, I'm not trying to argue that point. What I'm trying to put in place is that Matthew 16 is our history. It's present truth. And it's saying that one of the first controversies in our history is over a misapplication of what the signs and the scriptures represent. And at the conclusion of this dialogue, Jesus says to the Pharisees, beware of the leaven, not to the Pharisees, to the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Okay, and they're thinking, oh, did we bring any bread? And he he, he straightly tells them, no, I'm talking about what they're teaching. My point is, in this other side of the issue, they're they're saying that to, to, to identify that there are two parties developing is to take the position of the accuser of the brethren in Zechariah 3. And the accuser of the brethren in Zechariah 3 is Satan. It's called that. So they're saying, if you're going to start making a distinction between the two parties in the history from 9-11 to midnight, then you're fulfilling the role of Satan. But the point is, right here, once you see this as present truth, Jesus is warning you. You have to beware of false teachings in this history. That's what he's saying, okay? This is a warning right there. And then it places us at Caesarea Philippi. It places us, places us at Paneum. It places us where Jesus is telling Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. It's placing us at the midnight cry where the church triumphant is established in our day and age. And that's what we're saying is going on here. When he gets to Caesarea Philippi, which is the midnight cry, if you look, if you watch, you'll see a double question. Because we see doublings at the midnight cry, and we often see a question. And the question is, is who do men say that I am? The second question is, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter is given the privilege of giving the Christian confession, which is what the theologians call this statement by by Peter. But notice... That from this point on, when you're reading through there, you're purposely going to see two classes. And Sister White has already used Peter. uh, She's not in this illustration, but she's used Peter already before. And she said this about Peter. Peter represents two classes of worshipers. Okay, so in the everlasting gospel, based upon that statement, you can go through and show that Peter was the foolish when he failed three tests and he denied the Lord uh, before the cock crew, uh, the crucifixion. And then later on, he's representing the wise when Jesus comes to him and says, Peter, lovest thou me? Okay, so Peter is both the wise and the foolish. Sister White said he typifies both sides of the issue. And here he's doing the same thing. Because when he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says, Flesh and blood haven't, has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven hath revealed this to you. And he says, by the way, I'm going to the cross. And Peter says, I'm not going to let you go to the cross. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. So right there in that story, you have two classes illustrated 
by Peter. Okay, and this is the argument that's going on here. Can you see two classes? Can you see Peter doing the Christian confession? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And can you also see Peter saying, you're not going to the cross? In this story, when you apply this present truth, it's saying that the issue of two classes is going to be agitated and that both classes will be manifested before you get down here to midnight, okay? Because midnight is, is chapter 17. Midnight is the Mara, Mari experience, right? And in chapter 17, Jesus is going to take three disciples onto the mount, up to the Mount of Transfiguration and they're going to see Christ glorified. Okay, and when you come face to face with Christ glorified, you're so overwhelmed that what you do is Peter say, Lord, let me build not two, not one, but three tabernacles because you're in the binding off now. You're in midnight and you're going to see a three steps there. And Peter's saying, let me build three tabernacles. So in chapter 17, you're at midnight. You're at the Mari experience. And before you get to chapter 17, you're in chapter 16 and you see the two classes represented by Peter. But before you get to chapter 17, after you see the two classes represented by Peter, Jesus begins to tell them, I'm going to the cross. Okay, he's giving a prediction before midnight. Okay, I'm going to the cross. Um, and if you look closely, if the story of Caesarea Philippi happens on this day, in verse 1 of chapter 17, it says, and after six days. This gives you the prophetic license to say the experience at Caesarea Philippi is the first day. And then after six days, that brings you to the seventh day, which means it's on the eighth day that they're going to the Mount of Transfiguration. And we understand that from 9-11 to the Sunday Law, based upon 2 Chronicles 36, 29, 29, that it's 16 days to cleanse the temple for Passover. The first eight has to do with the priests, the second eight, the Levites. And, but we can show that, eight, that on the eighth day we come to midnight. So the first verse of chapter 17 allows you, just from the numerology of it all, to mark it at, I, I shouldn't say it that way. What's a good way to say it where people won't stumble over the word numerology? Is that, a, is that an okay word? No, it adds up. It adds up, yes, okay. From the, from the, from the numbering, okay. It, you, can put, you can put the transfiguration at the eighth day, which is midnight, okay. Um, wonderful number. Okay, so um, when you see these two temples, don't, don't miss that the temple to Caesar is state and the temple to Pan is church, okay? Because at the midnight cry, this is the image of the beast test. This is where church and state are coming together, right there at the midnight cry. And the midnight cry is Paneum, it's Caesarea Philippi, the things that, that are being, the, the wheels within wheels that are coming together in these verses in Daniel 11 are absolutely amazing, okay? And then Peter, this breakdown, Peter's a symbol of the 144,000, the symbol of those that recognize that at 9-11, the anointing takes place, okay? Um, so, over here, the, with the 45th president, And we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't get, it was in the notes, but I never got to the point in time where I discussed the two temple cleansings or the judgment of the living. But I did mention more than once Ezekiel 8, the four steps where they end up bowing down the sun. Here is the weeping for Tammuz, the false latter rain that's going on at the same time that the true latter rain is going on before the 25 men are bowing down to the sun here at midnight, Okay. So we dealt with that, but we never got to the level to where we placed Ezekiel 9 over the top. Okay, it's repeating in large. Ezekiel 8 is showing those people that receive the mark of the beast. They're going to bow down to the sun. Ezekiel 9 is the same history, but it's showing those that are going to get the seal of God. And Sister White says the sealing of Ezekiel 9 is the sealing of Revelation 7. And 
in these two histories, what you're seeing is the judgment of the living. Because in both stories, Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel 9, this is taking place in Jerusalem with people that are alive. Okay, so we're understanding that this, the closing work of the third angel, the, the sealing begins at 9-11, the sealing of the 144,000, and that it's illustrated among other places in Ezekiel 8 and 9, they're, because they're alive. And we also plug into that 9-11, we plug in 1840 to April 19th, 1844, a three-step testing process for the Protestants. It begins with a, a symbol of the incarnation when an angel comes down with a little book open in his hand and John, as a human being, eats that little book, combination of human and divine, right there on August 11th, 1840. First test, you have to eat that little book. You know, the only way that you can have Christ in you, the hope of glory, is to take the first step and fully and completely and truly come to the foot of the cross with repentance, confess your sins, and when you do, the incarnation takes place at, on August 11th, 1840, when no less a person than Jesus Christ comes down out of heaven. That's step number one, and it's taking place on the Protestants. They're being judged while they're alive. Step number two, 1843 chart, a visual manifestation of the testing process brought in in May of 1842, and Sister White says in testimonies, Volume 1, page 31. In June of 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures at the Casco Street Church in Portland, and with few exceptions, the Protestant churches closed their door against Mr. Miller. So when this chart comes in, this visual test, the Protestants begin to close their door, and when they get to April 19, 1844, their door is closed. So from that history, we can lay that right over Ezekiel 8 and 9 and see that the Protestants are typifying the judgment of the living. They were alive when that was taking place. And the door closes after the judgment process is concluded. Okay, Not the door closes and then the judgment of the living begins. Okay, But then you have the history that begins on April 19th. 1844, when not the first angel, but the second angel comes down and joins the first angel. But the second angel comes down. Once again, he has a writing in his hand, which symbolizes the incarnation. Now, the Millerites are going through the same testing process. Their visual second test is that the living testimony is restored, and it leads to the closed door on October 22nd, 1844. So in the history of 1840 to 1844, which is a glorious manifestation of the power of God, which these people are now denying that 9-11 to the midnight cry is the glorious manifestation of the power of God because we're not to look for those types of manifestations as have happened in the past, if you remember that quote. In the history of 1840 to 1844, you have two witnesses to illustration of the judgment of the living that you can plug in with Ezekiel 8 and 9. And in all of those, it shows that the judgment of the living, the process of settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that you will not be moved, is accomplished before the door closes. Therefore, the judgment of the living that began at 9-11, the work that it's doing, is going to be accomplished before the door closes at midnight. Okay, so in this history... When we're looking at Ezekiel 8, we see that the weeping of Tammuz is a counterfeit. Therefore, there is going to be rain falling in this history that is the genuine. And the thing that we learned after 9-11, when we began to look closely at the rest and the refreshing, was that the latter rain is a message. Okay, It's the messages of God's Spirit. So if... There's a counterfeit message going on in this history. There's going to be a true message going on in this history. And the true message that has been typified by the Millerite history is the midnight cry message, which, is, which brought to perfection the original message, judgment hour message. Therefore, the true message that would be going on in this history prior to the door closing at midnight would be the message of Daniel 11, 1 to 39, that is bringing to perfection the message of the last six verses of Daniel 11. Okay, uh, in this history, from 
One of the things that we can glean from the story of Paneum is that there's two temples. So you have here at Midnight Cry, Caesarea Philippi, at Jerusalem. Um, and by the way, Jerusalem is Zion, is it not? Okay, so Paneum is Sion. So Zion and Sion are right here at this same way mark. Okay, so, so at one level, if you're willing to see, it's representing the true church and the synagogue of Satan, which is another line that you can run down. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put anything derogatory on the, the, the understanding of Sion with an S. I'm just saying that prophetically, you can put Zion and Sion on this way mark, and at one level, you can see that the temple in Sion is a satanic temple. It's the temple of Pan. Okay, so you're, this is what the Omega Apostasy is all about. It's about a true and a counterfeit. The idea that the application of the Omega is this movement from 9-11 to midnight, and it's... And it's simply this movement, and it's not until probation closes at midnight that you can see the, the two classes separated. It destroys one of the, the basic truths about this warning of the Alpha in the writings of Sister White, and that is that she says a new movement and a new organization. By definition, it means you have to have an old movement and an old organization, or, or she wouldn't use the word new. Okay, so in this history here, these two movements have to come to fruition, and when they're coming to close to the close to the judgment, to the closed door, um, there's two latter rains that are falling, and the two temples of Paneum are emphasizing the image of the beast test, combination of church and state that begins here, but the temple of Pan is representing the strong delusion. We have two tests, brothers and sisters. We have two tests that start essentially at the same time. Are you and I recognizing that the, the church and state are coming together in the United States? Do you recognize that on November 8th slash 9th that the Protestants took control of all three branches of the government of the United States? Because in order to fulfill the prophecy of the image of the beast, they had to do that first. It's done. <coughs> Therefore, that's, that's a first warning step that the animals are getting on the ark for the priest. But at the same time, not all, that's the, represented by the temple to Caesar. But at the same time, on the same way mark, you have the temple of Pan that's representing the strong delusion. And sure enough, we're seeing the strong delusion right at the very same time that we're seeing church and state coming together. This book is, is so profound this truth of Daniel 1 through 39 is so profound, it, it's beyond human ability to understand. Let me, I'm going to, I'm already, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. There's tons more to say, but I want to put one more thing in place. When we began to, and I know most of you know this, but we're putting it in for the record for the people on the internet that might not have heard it. When we began to understand that this is the battle of Paneum and that Paneum is later called Caesarea Philippi and it brings all this together, it's when you go to chapter 45 of the Desire of Ages that you find this story of Caesarea Philippi. And the name of that chapter is the foreshadowing the cross. That's why I have the cross over here at the Sunday Law. We know the Sunday Law is the cross. Chapter 45 at Caesarea Philippi, chapter 45 of the Desire of Ages, the title is foreshadowing the cross. So it's telling us that this story takes place before the Sunday law. It takes place at the midnight cry. And there came a point in time where it clicked that, well, if chapter 45 of the Desire of Ages is illustrating the history that we're dealing with with chapter 45, what about other chapter 45s? So I want to close. I've said this before. I don't know if anyone's ever tested me on this. I've said it before, and sometimes I think, what, you know, was I stretching it because I haven't looked at it again? But no one's challenging me on this. Uh, so I, I guess if they're not challenging me, it m must be correct. But, but every time I go back and look, it's there. So I want to close with this. Uh, a simple one. There's only a few chapters in the Bible, a few books in the Bible that get enough chapters where you have a chapter 45 in them, okay? And one of, one of them is an easy one for us. Genesis chapter 45, 
What is Genesis chapter 45 talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you. You don't have to answer. This is the, join, the first time the two sticks are being joined. And we know that the two sticks get joined between the midnight cry and the Sunday law. But chapter 45 of Genesis is when Jacob's ten brothers come into Egypt, okay, and then he does his act of deception, leaves one there, and then his ten brothers come back again. Uh, and ultimately, Jacob comes down to join them in Egypt. And the total that came with Jacob is 70, which is a symbol of this history. So in chapter 45 of Genesis, you have this history right here. And you have his, he has 11 brothers, right, Joseph. But the two times that they come, it's 10 brothers each time. So you got a doubling of 10 here. Okay, so, so why, what I want to point you to over, over here, at the beginning of the United States, with the seven presidents followed by 10 presidents followed by the first president, and the end of the United States by the last president, followed by 10 kings, followed by the number seven Sabbath test. As a student of prophecy, you're to take the beginning and the end and put them together line upon line. Okay, so when you do that, you have the, where you join them, obviously, in my mind, is the 10 and the 10. So the 10 of this history here goes right here, and the 10 of this history goes right here. And what I'm saying is this story in Genesis 45 about the 10 brothers coming twice? Okay, this is a doubling of 10. It's a second witness to my claim. And you have other 10s in here anyway. But I want you to see something, if you will. Right here is the beginning of the United Nations rise to power. And in Isaiah chapter 8, there is a confederacy. And Isaiah says, Say unto this people to not walk in the way of this confederacy. And there's several verses there from like verse 10 to, to 13. And if you go far enough, you can see that it's in our time. It's in the ceiling. Seal the law among my disciples. It's in the ceiling time that Isaiah 8 is taking place. And when, she's, when Isaiah is speaking about this evil confederacy, um, Sister White takes those verses and she defines what the evil confederacy is in her writings on several passages. It's the globalist bankers, she says. It's the religion of spiritualism and Hinduism, spiritualism, she says. Um, and it's the Freemasonry, she says. And all these are the attributes of the United Nations and others. This evil confederacy in Isaiah 8 is the United Nations, which is beginning to rise to power right here. OK, so when you get when you bring these two tens together, 10 and 10, it's preceded by a seven. It's followed by a seven during the Sunday law testing time. But you have these two tens here. And if you can if you can get this in your head visually, OK, that this 10 here marks the the production of the Articles of Confederation. OK, so it's. When you bring this into our history, it's talking about some kind of legal document that establishes the evil confederation of the Ten Kings. In the American history, it was simply the name of the first constitution. But when you bring this Ten together with this Ten in our history, the Articles of Confederation is the Articles of the Confederation of the Evil Empire. Okay, so there's, there's much more light in here. But chapter 45 of Genesis, it's this history. Go to Psalm 45. Now, Brother Duane, if you followed his presentations, he's he was talking about the same thing I've been mentioning here, about the establishment of the church triumphant, and it takes place right here. And he spent some time about identifying the scepter and the rod. Okay, And in chapter 45, um, look at verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. His scepter is put back into history at the midnight cry with the church triumphant. Um, now, I'll cut in. I'm not gonna, I can't read every verse in these chapter 45s we're going to look at, so I'm going to go real fast. Go to verse 12. And the daughter of Ty, Tyre shall there be... 
and the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. This is the joining of the 11th hour workers coming out of Babylon. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter, this is the final church, the king's daughter. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is wrought of gold. This is the church triumphant, brothers and sisters. And the church triumphant is put in place at the midnight cry. And this is the 45th chapter of uh, Psalms. And I'll just drop down to verse 17 because I'm already out of time. It says, I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Chapter 45 of Psalms is a chapter about the church triumphant which plugs in with this very way, Mark. And in Isaiah 45, it's about Cyrus. Okay, and I'll, we'll just look at verse 3. It says, I will give thee the treasures of darkness and, the, and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by name, am the God of Israel. Okay, William Miller's casket is opened up at the same place that Pandora's casket is opened up. It's opened up at the midnight cry. And the promise is at the midnight cry, the spirit of prophecy is restored. All the gifts are restored. And the Bible is going to be opened up to the church triumphant the way it was with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the way it was with Sister White after they put the pillars together post-1844. Okay, so chapter 45 of Isaiah is this same history. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 45 is the spiritual temple that never got built. But Ezekiel 45 is giving you the distinction between the priest and the Levites, okay, and the king. Because David's throne is going to get established. So you read Ezekiel 45, you're going to see it has to do with the putting in order of the priest, the Levites, and the king. That's what's going on at the Midnight Cry, brothers and sisters. Chapter 45 of Ezekiel is also speaking to this history. And one other place is Jeremiah. Jeremiah 45 is short and to the point. But it's talking about another element that's taking place in this very history. Chapter 45 of Jeremiah says, The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, say, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch, Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow, I fainted in my sighing, I find no rest. Brothers and sisters, at the midnight cry, Islam is going to strike a second time. It's going to cripple the United States. It's going to cause such a crisis around the world as the economy of the United States goes down, giving the, the backdrop to bring in a dictatorship that Jeremiah chapter 45, he's expressing the, the lamentations of God's people in this history with the word woe. Okay, none of these are accidents. Okay, and, and I would challenge you to take the Conflict of the Ages series. Great Controversy doesn't have enough chapters. But Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Acts of the Apostles, and the Desire of Ages, chapter 45, are all speaking to this history. Okay, so what I'm saying is, the light that has been opened up by the first 39 verses of Daniel 11, it goes so many directions. It's, it's, it's the, the wheels within the wheels. It goes so many directions. It reaches out to the history of Paneum. It reaches out to the story in Matthew 16. It addresses Palmoni, the wonderful number, the creator, creator of all things, including math. Okay? It, it, it qualifies as what type of message you would expect that the midnight cry would typify. And when that message comes into history, the evidence is, is that there's a counterfeit message that is there waiting for it to try to prevent it from going forward, and that is here as well. So I'm not saying that we, I do not personally believe that we're at Boston, but we're this close, I think, and I don't know, but I think we're this close to May 2nd, when there's going to be a prediction nicely formalized from 
the first 39 verses of Daniel 11 that will mark a, a prediction that's given before midnight. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence during this time that we've come together over these days to study these truths. We understand that we are on the close, we're very close to the close of our probation and that by and large, we as your people are not ready. We ask that among other things, the message that we have heard here over these days would be used by the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to each of us of our need of personal preparation for this coming crisis. We also ask that you would give us the the willingness and the burden to, to test these things and make this message our own message, that we will be prepared to give an answer to any man that would want to know. We thank you for allowing us to participate in such a sacred and holy work, and we're amazed that we're even allowed to because we're so unworthy, but we thank you for that in any case. We, we know that these things are being marked um, in the Book of Remembrance, that we've come together to discuss these things, and we ask that our name would remain in that Book of Remembrance, and as well as the Book of Life, uh, that this very meeting that we've had here would be one of those entries to where you can acknowledge that we came together and we brought our attention upon the right subjects. We ask a blessing as we break camp, traveling mercies for all of us that are going to head out and for those that are already on the road, and as we break for the physical food, we ask also that you would bless that to our nourishment and bless the hands that have prepared it. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.